Can you remember your first history lesson? As it happens, I can. Uh, because I was told a story, and it's the story I remember, so I know that it was in a history lesson. Uh, it was at a little rural primary school in the West Country, very old-fashioned, old, much-carved. Can you name two rivers in Normandy? Can you name two seaports in Normandy? Can you name a cathedral city in Normandy? There are half a dozen of them. Can you even tell us why Normandy was called Normandy? The minute you're told, of course, you say, yes, that's obvious. What had happened in the 9th, 8th and 9th century, Vikings had travelled everywhere, as you know, um, causing mayhem and destruction all over the place. And they were known, obviously, as the Northmen because they had come from the north. Some of them settled in the north of France. The King of France was um, at his wit's end to know what to do with these Norman raiders, until in the end he thought, right, well, if they've come here to look for land and to seize it, let's give them some, and that might stop the other raids coming. By and large, it worked. So they settled in northern France. So the Northmen settled in what they became, uh, what became known as Normandy. Normandy became Normandy. So that's where Normandy comes from. Um, but to carry on the, the the questionnaire, apart from 1066, can you name another single date in Norman history? Take William. What do you know? about William the Conqueror. All right, so he was called William the Conqueror. But he was 38 years old when he conquered England. Do you know anything about uh, William before he was 38 years old? I bet you don't. Oh, yes, you might know one thing. You will know that he was called William the Bastard. Why? Obviously, because his father had neglected to marry his mother. We know his mother's name, Arlette. She lived in a Norman town called Falaise. Uh, if you go to Falaise today, uh, you will see a castle, and they will tell you that it is the castle of Duke Robert of Normandy. It wasn't actually, it was built sometime later, but never mind. That's what the legend is for the tourists. And the story goes that Robert looked out of the window of his castle one day, and down by the stream there were some young women of the town doing the family laundry. And he rather liked the look of one of them. And as Norman barons and Norman lords were accustomed to doing, he sent word down that this particular one, Arlette, was to be brought up to the castle. Later on, um, uh, he didn't marry her, but he took her as his life's partner. And she became the mother of William. Uh, so that's the legend. So say they'll even show you the window in Falaise Castle out of which Robert looked when he caught sight of Arlette. But it's a different castle, I'm afraid. Anyway, William came to the throne very young because his father had gone on a pilgrimage, got ill, died, so didn't come back, and William found himself in charge of a duchy at the age of seven or eight. Uh, you can imagine what happened. Uh, his rule in Normandy was beset by, by other uh, barons, nobles, foreigners, the King of France, pretty well anybody who fancied his chances of seizing a bit of extra territory. And William was very fortunate in, in having uh, two or three guardians who looked after him very fa In fact, two died in their duty of looking after William. So he grew up in a very, very stern set of circumstances. On at least two occasions, he was yanked out of bed in the middle of the night because assassins were actually in the castle with the daggers out, trying to kill him. You can imagine what a life like this must have done to a growing boy. So he grew up very hard indeed. He learned soldiering very early. He was commanding men in battle when he was 15 years old. So by the time he got to 38, there wasn't very much you could tell William about running a duchy in medieval France. Uh, he was a very successful one too. He had plenty of enemies, uh, particularly the King of France himself. 
This was the man who, at the age of 38, had embarked on the conquest of England. Uh, why? Well, we'll come to that a little bit later on. The illegitimacy. Today, um, illegitimacy doesn't matter very much. Not all that long ago, a young woman who got herself into an interesting condition could often face the door of her own house slammed in her face and her own father telling her never to darken the doorstep again. Luckily, that's all gone. But in 11th century Normandy, it was a very, very serious business indeed. The most important thing in the world was land and you had to have your title to that land secured beyond any possible doubt or challenge. And the way to do that was to prove that your father had married your mother. So the succession could be proved, you would have continuity, you would have security. Medieval Europe lived in a state of far greater insecurity than we do today. Um, what do we know about the country he conquered? Frankly, not very much. Na name three facts about England in the 11th century. You might know it was ruled by somebody called Edward the Confessor. True, but I bet you don't know why he was called Edward the Confessor. Um, do you know about the, the old countries of England? Do you know if I said the word to you, heptarchy, would it mean anything? In fact, it means the land of the seven kingdoms. Heptarchy comes from a Greek word meaning seven. Uh, based on the early conquests of the Saxons. As you well know, the South Saxons settled in what became and is Sussex, the East Saxons, Essex, the West Saxons, Wessex, and so on. Curiously, we do not have a county of Nossex. We don't know what happened to the North Saxons, if indeed there were any. They used the word shire, uh, so that much would have been familiar to you. Um, in fact, the man in charge of the shire uh, produces another word which you're extremely familiar with for another reason. A man put in charge of a farm or an estate was known as the reeve. So a man put in charge of a shire was known as a shire reeve. Carry that on for a few decades, allow for people's laziness and pronunciation, and shire reeve becomes sheriff. Sheriff was the chief executive officer in a county in England in the 11th century. <clears throat> As you well know, sheriff means something completely different in America. So we know a little bit, well, I've just told you a little bit about the shires, about the counties, but you would be making a mistake if you thought of England as one single country. Now, geographically, of course, it was. But culturally, uh, demographically, to use a long word, it wasn't. Why? Because of the invasions of the Vikings from the 8th century onwards. As you well know, at least I hope you do, King Alfred made his reputation defeating the invading Danes. Being not only a warrior, but a very shrewd statesman as well, he tried to provide for the future by arranging that there should be no more wars. So he did what the King of France did to the Normans. He gave them some land. He signed a treaty which allowed the Danes to settle in the area of England, which they had already been trying to conquer, the north and the east. And he allowed that Danish law should run in these particular counties. Hence the word Dane law. That was the area of England where Danish law applied and where the customs were Danish, where a large slice of the population were Danish or descended from Danes. So England was not exactly two countries, but there, there were two clearly defined sections of it. All right, there was intermarriage, there was trade, a gradual merging the one into the other, but they still had separate personalities. Uh, and that applied in 1066. Uh, so, you didn't know that. You didn't know about the, the old countries. How much do you know about the culture of England in the 11th century? 
Not much, I don't suppose, neither do I, and certainly neither did the Normans. They were going to somewhere about which they knew very little indeed. They probably didn't have much idea about how big it was, and they certainly didn't have much idea about the population. Have you any idea how many people lived in England in 1066? Now there are about 60 million. In 1066, so far as we can judge, there were less than 2 million, one thirtieth of what we've got now. Well, we all think we know about the Norman Conquest. William the Conqueror sailing across, landing at Hastings, fighting a great big battle and winning. So we know the mechanics of it. We know how. But do we know why? What brought William over here to conquer England? Well, you would think one motive might be pretty obvious, greed. Uh, William was a greedy man, certainly. When he died and they wrote his obituary, uh, they did mention the fact that he was avaricious. They used the word avarice. Uh, he was avaricious beyond average. Uh, so that much is most definitely true. A prince, a duke, a count, a king, whatever you like, in the 11th century had to develop his image if he was to stay in business to attract a following, to protect his rule, to help his people feel, feel secure. He had to do big things. He had to do noble things. He had to give justice. He had to be fair. Uh, he had to provide for the future. <clears throat> and he had to keep a, an eye out for the main chance to show his own people and everybody else that he was not to be trifled with. So William saw his chance with England. Um, there's nothing unusual about that. Pretty well all medieval princes did pretty much the same. As an illustration, I'm sure you've heard of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was King of Macedonia in Greece. His entire career was taken up with conquering the Persian Empire, which was enormous. Uh, people often wondered why. Uh, Alexander had grown up in fear of the Persian Empire, and any Greek would want to get his own back on the Persian Empire, ideally, of course, remove it altogether. So the suggestion is that Alexander conquered the Persian Empire because it never occurred to him not to. That was the thing that he was there for. And in a similar way, William got the idea of conquering England because no alternative appeared particularly serious to him. And this was reinforced by the fact that in 1051, 51, 15 years before the conquest, he'd visited England and he'd met the king, Edward the Confessor. He was in fact distantly related to Edward the Confessor because his great aunt, Emma, Emma of Normandy, was Edward the Confessor's mother. So there was a family relationship. And William claimed, when he got back to Normandy, not only that Edward had uh, looked with favour upon him, treated him as a favoured and distinguished guest and made a great fuss of him, but that he, Edward, would promise him, William, the crown, when he, Edward, died. Now that's not so preposterous as it sounds, because William, sorry, Edward, uh, had no children, and he was not going to have any either, because he had refused to have any kind of intimate relations with his wife. So the succession, the question of the succession, was yawning wide open and getting wider with each successive year. So when the story got around that Edward had promised the crown to William, you can imagine the effect that this would have in, uh, in Normandy, and in England for that matter, uh, great hope and excitement possibly in Normandy, uh, annoyance, indignation, even outrage in England. Who did this jumped up bastard duke think he was talking about inheriting the throne of England? But there, that was a motive, and a very, very powerful motive. That, plus the fact, as I said, he always had an eye to the main charge. Any medieval prince did. Any medieval prince had to carve a reputation for himself. 
he was only as successful as his last campaign. <clears throat> that was what medieval dukes did. Now, that does not mean that William the Conqueror leapt out of bed one morning, feeling good, and said, Hooray! Yippee! What a splendid morning this is in the Middle Ages. It's great to be living in the Middle Ages. I know, chaps. Let's go and conquer England today, shall we? Clearly, it was not like that. It took a very long time. And one of the questions that needed to be asked was, was it realistic? It's all very well to have these wonderful ideas, but look at the size of England. Look at the size of Normandy. Was it really going to work? Was it realistic? And if it wasn't, how on earth was he going to sell it to his, uh, to his barons, to his vassals, to his, to his sub-tenants? <clears throat> you see, William just couldn't issue a set of call-up papers and expect all his Norman barons to, to come to the feudal host and bring all their soldiers with him. Because generally speaking, um, there well, not only generally, but always, there were laws about this. The rule said that a knight was bound to serve his overlord for 40, year, 40 days a year, free. 40 days a year, free. But most of the regulations implied that that service of 40 days a year only meant within the territory that he ruled, in other words, Normandy. It didn't cover going on wild adventures to places like England. And in any case, quite a large number of his Norman vassals thought it was crazy. They too had looked at the map of England and Normandy. Uh, and they reckoned Normandy w would be on a hiding to nothing. Look at the population of England, look at the resources of England, look at the size of England's army, look at the reputation, look at their history. They had 500 years of history. The Normans had only been there 150 years. They didn't stand a chance. So too many Norman barons who'd worked very hard all their lives to, to carve out their own particular set of property weren't going to risk it all on some crazy enterprise in England where they could lose the lot. So not all William's vassals were willing to follow him, not by a long chalk. Then he tried the idea of the oath. I, I don't know how much you know about this, but this is coming later on in the talk. Harold swore an oath that when Edward the Confessor died, that the throne would pass to William and that he, Harold, would not stand in William's way. Harold later on broke this oath by becoming king himself. So William could use the great story that Harold was a perjurer, therefore William was doing the decent thing by invading England to put right a great sin committed by Harold, Earl of Wessex. Now, did the Norman barons buy this idea? <clears throat> I should think it's very unlikely. Um, the oath itself, the very story of the oath, didn't sound very likely. It didn't sound very likely that Harold was be, um, willing to keep it. Harold possibly only swore it in order to get back to England. He was living with William at the time, in Normandy, staying with William. Nevertheless, it was a good story and it was very respectable. It made the conquest respectable. William was carrying out the wishes of God by punishing a sinner. So, as I said, it was a good story and it was a good line. But the odds, I repeat, were very, very unfair. We, if you had gone to a bookie in 1066 and said, what are the odds on England and Normandy? He would have given you very short odds, very poor odds on William and very good odds on England. And that's ironic because <clears throat> you know about the Spanish Armada. In 1588, again, look at the map, look at the size of England, look at the size of Spain. We didn't have a cat in hell's chance against the Spanish Armada. The same thing applied when we fought against Louis XIV. He was enormously more powerful than England, and we didn't lose that either. In 1805, Napoleon's army was poised on the coast of France, only 30 miles away, all ready to invade England. And we didn't think we had, in, in, in sheer numbers, we didn't have the resources to stop him. But we didn't lose that war either. In 1940, 
the odds were even longer against us. The whole of Nazi Europe was under the well, the whole of Europe was under the Nazi rule. We didn't stand a cat in hell's chance then either, and we survived that. So the Spanish Armada, Louis the Fourteenth, Napoleon, Hitler. Each time we were the underdog, and we won. And in 1066, we were not the underdog, we were the top dog, and we lost. I don't know if there's a moral in that anywhere. Who saw 1066 coming? Did it show any signals on the horizon? <clears throat> it's interesting that many of the, or several of the big dates in English history uh, took people by surprise. And you could argue that, that 1066 was one of them. The, the Civil War was another. The Civil War broke out in 1642. But in 1641, nobody had the faintest idea that the Civil War was on the way. And when it broke out, many, many men, serious, scholarly, sensitive men, knowledgeable men, scratched their heads and shook their heads and said, how on earth did this come about? How did we get to be in this position of fighting a war against our fellow countrymen? Same thing happened in 1914. The country went on holiday in July of 1914. They'd heard that some Austrian Duke had got himself assassinated. That was a bit of a yawn, nobody took much notice. And by August the 4th, the whole of Europe was at war. Again, men shook their heads and wondered how on earth it had all come about. The big things take you by surprise. All right, William the Conqueror, let's go back to 1066. William the Conqueror saw it coming, all right? He wanted it to come. All he had to do was to wait for Edward the Confessor to die, and Edward was not all that old. So he might have to wait a long time. But did France want it, or did France see it coming? Very unlikely. The French king would always look out for an opportunity to score over Normandy. But beyond that, I don't see how his crystal ball could have told him anything about the events of 1066 in advance. <clears throat> England, no, we had a safe king, Edward, the confessor. Um, we know that, well, they knew then that he didn't have um, an obvious successor. And they knew they didn't want William. But by this time, clearly, far and away above everybody else, the second man in the kingdom was Harold, the Earl of Wessex. He was the king's right-hand man. He was the second man in the kingdom. He practically ran the country. If ever there was an obvious next king, it was Harold. The only thing against him was that he did not uh, belong to the blood royal. But he was the obvious next king. <clears throat> Uh, did other people take notice? Yes, uh, surprisingly, Norway took notice because there was a very powerful uh, uh, king in Normandy, also called Harold. Uh, we distinguished the two because our Harold was Harold with an O. Uh, in Norway, it was Harald with an A. And he had an eye on the throne of England too. He was another prince, always looking out for the main chance. Uh, he had a fearsome reputation. He had fought everybody. He had been in every country. He had even been a member of the legendary bodyguard of the emperor at Constantinople, no less. It was a fearsome, legendary reputation. And the mere sight of him uh, was enough to strike awe into anybody. Apparently, he stood six feet six, when the average height of a man was barely five feet six. Uh, and Harald of Normandy, Harald Hadrada, they called him, the stern ruler, he had eyes for the English crown. So there, was the Nor there were the Normans, uh, Norwegians, um, all ready to jump when something happened. By the same token, surprisingly, Denmark had eyes on England as well. Doesn't look a very big country now, and it isn't, but it was very powerful. In the 11th century, we had already had four Danish kings. Everybody's heard of King Canute, but he wasn't the first, he was the second. His father, Swain, conquered England in 1014, and son, Canute, succeeded in 1016. 
and his two sons succeeded him. In 1035, we had had four Danish kings. So the Danes were very interested in what was going on in England in 1066. Flanders, which is nowadays Holland and Belgium, they were interested too, not so much because of politics, but because of the trade. Flanders was the centre of a wool and weaving trade. England produced an awful lot of sheep. An enormous amount of trade passed between the two countries. So the Count of Flanders was immensely interested in English politics for business reasons. Germany, no, probably too far away. But soldiers of fortune in Germany kept their eyes and ears open. And there was no shortage of soldiers of fortune when William was building his army in the middle of 1066, they came flocking in from everywhere. Germany, Denmark, Lorraine, Alsace, Switzerland, northern Italy, northern Spain, you name it, they came in from these places to join William's army and see what rich pickings there would be. A word of warning, when you decide to study any year from the past, always try and look at it from the point of view of the people who lived in it. Don't look at 1066 with the preconceptions of the year 2019. An obvious example is this word Europe. Now we know that France and England and Italy and Spain and all the rest in 1066 were in the continent of Europe, just as they are today. And we talk about living in Europe today, but men in 1066 did not talk about living in Europe, if they wanted a word to convey the whole, the whole lot, if you like, they called it Christendom. It was where the word of Christ was supreme. This was the land which had been founded by the Holy Roman Catholic Church, God's Church. They did not use the word Europe. They regarded Christendom uh, as not just a stretch of land, but it was a fortress, it was a bastion, it was the final defence against this sea of wilderness and paganism and heresy uh, that threatened the entire, what we call, Western Europe. Not only that, we were at the mercy of the elements. To the west was the Atlantic Ocean, and nobody knew where that went. To the north was ice and snow, and nobody knew how far that went. To the east was miles and miles of forest and marsh. If you went further north, it was tundra and more ice and snow. If you went south, you would run into the Sahara Desert. So you've got to remember that men in those days, if they thought at all, thought about the world as, as I say, this bastion of Christendom, against the elements, against savage weather, against the climate, and against the pagans and the Muslims and the infidels and whatever other unpleasant adjective you had for describing them. For those who lived in Christendom and who fought to keep it going, life, in a word, was hard. It was a veil of tears. It was hard and it didn't last very long. If you made it to 45 or 50, you were doing pretty well. All you could hope for was that when it was over, uh, if you're lucky, uh, you might go to paradise, which was going to be absolutely wonderful. It had jolly well better be after the terrible things that they'd had to put up with in the life they were living. And when you died, of course, it was your body only that died, your soul survived. And it was your soul that was going to go, you hoped, to heaven. So your soul was important. No matter how harsh life was, no matter how unpleasant many people were, no matter how much cruelty, no matter how much cheating, no matter how much murder, no matter how much crime, most men and women at bottom accepted the fact that your soul was there and that it was eternal, and that it was important. People were concerned about what... They were concerned enough about what happened to their bodies, but they were even more concerned about what happened to their eternal soul. So what they had, what they were putting up with, didn't look as if it was going to be subjected to very much change. It was so hard, it was so unrelenting, there was no hope. This was what life was going to be like. Nothing very much happened. 
except there are always exceptions. Now and again, there was an event, and that did upset things, and people had to react to events. And the one event which is relevant to this particular topic came in the year 1064. News reached France, and reached Normandy, obviously, that there had been a shipwreck. A boat had been cast up on the shore at the mouth of the River Somme in Normandy. And when men went to investigate who was on it, a crew, obviously, but the most important, there was a celebrity on it. And his name was Harold, and he was the Earl of Wessex. The Earl of Wessex, a Saxon Earl, had been shipwrecked off the coast of Normandy. What on earth were they going to do about that when the Normans heard about it? Inevitably, after they got over the shock, uh, they said, what is he doing in Normandy? What on earth is he up to? The Normans are great chess players. They love planning in advance. They love working out reasons for things. They love working out the background. They like method. They like system. They could not, for the life of them, work out what on earth Harold had in mind when he came to Normandy. Never crossed their mind that he might have come there by accident. Yeah. There was once an Austrian chancellor called Metternich, and in 1815 he was at a famous congress in Vienna, and everybody was there. And in the middle of the night, his servants woke him up to tell him that the Russian ambassador had just suddenly died. And Metternich propped himself on an elbow and said to himself, I wonder what he means by that. The Normans were great ones for wondering what anybody meant by anything. What did Harold mean? What was he up to? What was his real game? And Harold, of course, being Harold, didn't care what they were thinking. If they want to think he wanted to think he was up to something, then he was up to something. His job was to get home. He was the second man in the kingdom. He was running the place. He had to get back as soon as possible. If the Normans wanted to tie themselves in knots, well, that was their business, and he let them get on with it. Harold did get home. That's another story later on. We'll come to that. And everything went quiet until January 1066. And then, my word, things didn't half start to happen. Firstly, Edward the Confessor died on January the 5th, I think it was. On January the 6th, Harold got himself crowned. <laughs> you think Queen Elizabeth II was crowned in June of 1953, but in fact she became queen in February 1952. It took 16 months to crown Elizabeth. It took Harold 24 hours because he had to move fast. He had to get himself on the throne, with the crown on his head, anointed by holy oil, approved of by the church, and all the rest of it, so that he was the rightful, legal, honourable Christian king. And it took him 24 hours, so it didn't hang about. Uh, and then what a year! In 1066 saw not one king but three on the English throne. There were two coronations. There was Halley's Comet. Ever heard of Halley's Comet? Well, it appeared in 1066 in the sky, and it's in the tapestry. There is a picture of this star in the heavens, and people pointing to it and wondering, another thing, what on earth is that? What does that mean? What on earth is going on there? And of course, because it was a celestial happening, uh, the world was not short, and England was not short of people to wag their finger in the air and say, hey, you mark my words, no good will come of it. So it set off all sorts of superstitious reactions among the English. There was not one invasion of England, there were two. Uh, while before that happened, um, <clears throat> Harold had to build an army where most of his troops were away farming. William had to build an army. This is where he brought in all those soldiers of fortune from all over the place. He also had to build a navy. How could he get his soldiers across the channel? to say nothing of thousands of horses. Without building, he had to build a fleet first, not just the odd ship. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of ships. We're talking about thousands of horses. You think of the feat of organisation that's required, not just collecting the personnel, 
but uh, building the damn thing, felling trees, all the saws required, all the adzes, all the nails, everything, all had to be done in one year. Then, of course, it's one thing to get all that ready, but then he needs an army. And as I said, he can't send out call-up papers. He has to persuade enough of his vassals, enough of his barons, to commit themselves to something which could lose them everything, life, property, family, the lot. He had to be very, very persuasive indeed. And there was not one battle in 1066, there were three. And Harold <coughs> very nearly won two of them. The first one is in the north called Fulford when the King of Norway arrived and won a battle. The second battle was at Stamford Bridge where Harold marched 200 miles in the space of a fortnight, caught the Vikings unprepared and annihilated them. Then came news that William had landed so he had to march 200 miles all the way back again and took on William at Hastings and he very nearly won. It was touch and go right until the end of the afternoon. Now you just think, if Harold had pulled that off, if Harold had marched nearly 200 miles, defeated the greatest Viking alive, annihilated his army, marched 200 miles back again, defeated William, annihilated the Normans, his reputation would have rung down the centuries. He would have been up there with Marlborough and the Duke of Wellington, possibly even higher. And he came so close. Uh, and that wasn't all. Uh, I haven't told you yet that Scotland was involved in all this because the Scots never missed an opportunity to invade England and cause trouble if they thought England was in trouble. So there was an invasion from Scotland. There was an invasion too from one of Harold's brothers. Uh, there were a family of six sons. Swain had died. Harold was all right the next. One of his younger brothers was called Tostig. And Tostig had been made Earl of Northumbria, made a mess of it. Harold sacked him. And Tostig spent the rest of his life swearing vengeance and threatening to invade with whoever could he could persuade to give him an army and a fleet. So Tostig was going to invade as well. And Tostig finished up first with Scotland and then with the King of Norway. Tostig was a nuisance. A thoroughly nasty piece of work too. So we had Fulford, we had Stamford Bridge, we had Hastings. At the end of it all, Tostig was dead, he died at Stamford Bridge. Harold Hadrada was dead, he died at Stamford Bridge. Uh, the man who fired that arrow uh, must have, or would have congratulated himself for the rest of his life had he lived. He took a pot shot at Harold Hadrada, six feet six, and struck him in the throat. And Hadrada died. Uh, I've no doubt that the Vikings um, went berserk for revenge afterwards, and that archer couldn't have lived to enjoy his success for very long. Even William, you would think, having won the battle, everything would have been all right. No, William got dysentery. You can imagine what camp life was like. No hygiene at all. Uh, William was laid out for four or five weeks with dysentery, so he could have gone too. Imagine the vacuum then. And even that was not the end, because at last he got himself crowned on Christmas Day of 1066. And everybody who was anybody, those who were left, uh, was in Westminster Abbey, Edward the Confessor's brand new Westminster Abbey. <coughs> when it got to the stage where uh, they had to ask the crowd whether they approved of King William, so they all were going to shout, long live King William. They did. They let rip with an enormous shout. And the crowd outside heard it. And the Norman troops guarding the streets heard it. And they thought there was a riot. They thought everything had gone wrong. So they dashed round all the houses round about the abbey and burning them down. They could have been within an inch of burning down the abbey itself. They say even William was, was shaken by what had happened. The chronicler refers to the fact that William's knuckles whitened as he held on to the arms of the coronation throne. Uh, but, all right, it turned out to be a false alarm, but it was a very close call once again. So, 
What do you know about the bio-tapestry? Short answer is probably not much. But you know it's a tapestry, obviously. You know that it was made of Bayer, equally obviously. Uh, Bayer's in France, yes, you know that. Uh, you know it's all about um, the Norman Conquest. Uh, that's how we know so much about the Norman Conquest. You know that it was made by William the Conqueror. And you know that it's all about Hastings. <laughs> well, not quite. Um, historians are the most terrible killjoys. Uh, they will tell you that Harold was not shot in the eye with an arrow after all. More of that perhaps later on. They tell you that Alfred didn't burn the cakes. What a shame. They tell you that Robin Hood did not look like Errol Flynn and he didn't win the war against King John all by himself. He probably didn't exist at all. Uh, and King John didn't sign Magna Carta because he couldn't write. Um, so, by the same token, I have to tell you, being a, a killjoy historian, that the biotapestry was not made in Bayeux. It's only talked about. They only call it the biotapestry because the first reference to it comes in the 15th century, over 400 years after it was commissioned. And they found it in a church inventory, inventory in, in, in Bayeux. That's why they call it the biotapestry. Otherwise, it had nothing to do with Bayeux. Uh, it was not ordered by William, we know that. We think that most of the scholars seem to agree that it was ordered by William's brother, Odo, Bishop of Bayeux. Make you think. Uh, William, uh, William's mother, Arlette, remember Arlette? Um, when uh, Robert died, she married again. When her husband died, she married again. Or well, not the man who was not her husband, but her partner died, she married again. She really did marry this chap. He was a, a tradesman in, in uh, Falaise, I think, and she had two children. One of them was Odo, and William made him Bishop of Bayeux when he was 14. Um, so the Bayeux tapestry was not made in Bayeux. It was not ordered by William. And as for being all about the Battle of Hastings, they don't mention the Battle of Hastings till it's about 75% over. Only 25% of the tapestry is about the Battle of Hastings. Oh, yeah, and the final thing, it wasn't a tapestry. <laughs> it was an embroidery. So there. You say it wasn't about Hastings. What about all those pictures? The axes and the swords and the horses and the arrows. It's true, true, true. But 75% of the bio-tapestry is about other things as well. The bio-tapestry tells you only what the Normans want you to know. Give an example. I told you that it was created by Odo, Bishop of Bayeux. Now, two Norman bishops fought at Hastings. One was Odo himself, bully for, him, bully for Odo. Another was a man called Geoffrey, who was the Bishop of Coutances, a town in western Normandy. Now, Odo and Geoffrey didn't get on. And it's most interesting that when you look at the tapestry, you'll see Odo depicted three or four times, but you don't see Geoffrey at all. Odo edited Geoffrey right out of, of the bio tapestry. So it tells you what it wants you to know. So you mean it isn't true? Oh yes, it's true, but it's not the whole truth. It's out to prove something. Medieval historians always wanted a moral to their stories. History was not just one damn thing after another. It all meant something, and you could always get a lesson from it. There was a great deal of finger-wagging involved with medieval historians. God was involved. Harold had lost, not because he wasn't good enough. Harold lost because he ought to have lost. He had sinned, and God had punished him. Serve him jolly well right. He was a perjurer. In medieval illustrations, funnily enough, uh, blinding is often shown as, as a punishment for the sinner. Uh, you know, we're told that Harold got shot in the eye. More of that later. Uh, so the idea that a sinner was blinded uh, by God's order w was quite a common one. Take the idea of Samson, if you like, whether you could interpret that as God's punishment. Well, if the bio-tapestry wasn't about the, bio, uh, about the Battle of Hastings, what the devil was it about? Well, pretty well everything else. Kings, castles, 
hunting, feasting, shipbuilding, sailing, getting shipwrecked, types of military equipment, horses, cavalry chart, absolutely everything under the sun. I mentioned I barely scratched the surface. And there were 230 feet of it. There are 230 feet of it now, and as far as we know, very little has been lost. If you want to write a history of almost anything in the medieval world, you'll find evidence in the biotapestry. You can get some ammunition out of the biotapestry. Now let's go back for a minute. Why would Harold go to Normandy? It doesn't seem to make sense. The, one of the very first panels in the tapestry appears to show us that King Edward is ordering Harold to go to Normandy, which seems odd. The interpretation is that Harold is being sent by Edward to Normandy to confirm the promise that William will get the crown. Now, this doesn't make sense either, because Harold is the second man in the kingdom. He's the obvious next king. How is it that Edward is able to get Harold to go to Normandy to promise a thing like this? Did he have the authority? Could he make Harold go? Did he really have the strength to confirm his orders? We don't know. So was he just obeying the king or was it something else? Was Harold using the opportunity? Was he, he was a great opportunist. Uh, opportunist. If Edward had ordered him to go, Harold might have said, well, all right, I'll go. It'll give me a chance to size up the opposition. Find out what sort of a man William is. Case the joint. Get the feel of Normandy. So Harold could be using it uh, for his own purposes. Uh, I haven't told you yet. Um, Harold had a couple of relations, a, a brother and a, and a nephew. When William had visited Normandy in 1051, and Edward had promised him the crown, so they said, um, hostages were given. It was a regular thing in the Middle Ages. If you had an agreement, a promise, anything like that, one side gave hostages to the other for good behaviour, obviously. If the, if, the, if the partner in the agreement didn't, didn't obey, then the hostages, the hostages get killed. And these two young Saxon hostages have been living in Normandy since 1051. So the suggestion is that Harold went to Normandy to get these two young men back. Why? Obviously, because he was clearing the decks for when the time would come when he would have to defend England against William, because he obviously would. Everybody knew that. These two men were out for the crown, and they were rivals. And clearly some kind of reckoning was going to come somewhere. So was Harold in Normandy simply to try to get these two boys back <coughs> from being hostages? Was he simply clearing the decks? Or another interpretation, was he not going to Normandy at all? Uh, it was quite common in the 11th century for noblemen, those with ships, to travel by sea when the alternative was available. Travel by land was terrible. Roads were awful. Uh, not only awful, they could be dangerous. I mean, there was no police force. Uh, there were no traffic alarms or anything like this. Anything could happen on the road. As late as the 18th century, 700 years later, John Wesley, the Methodist preacher, nearly drowned in a pothole on the Great North Road. That gives you some idea of how uncomfortable road travel was. So if you had a chance to travel from one part of Hampshire to Sussex, shall we say, and you had the chance of travelling by sea, you travel by sea. Much easier. And Harold, he was the Earl of Wessex. He had access to seaports all around Hampshire and Sussex. It makes perfect sense that Harold was on a boat trip. And another thing that um, gives you that impression too, the third or fourth panel in the biotapestry shows you Harold leaving the king. But he's not just riding away. He has hounds and falcons with him. Now, if you're going to travel to Normandy on, on an embassy, do you normally take falcons and hounds with The suggestion is that Harold was simply on a hunting expedition. Went on board ship to go somewhere else hunting, 
and there was a storm. Uh, the English Channel is not noted for its similarity to a mill pond. Um, storms are quite frequent. Harold could simply have been caught. And when you're caught in a westerly storm, most of them were westerly, ships in the 11th century were so poorly constructed that there was no way they could sail against the wind. So the only alternative, if you were hit by a westerly gale, was to go, was to go in front of it, up the channel, until you got tipped onto the shore at the mouth of the River Somme, as Harold was. Once again, of course, we don't know. Many historians have asked why Harold took the chance of going to, assuming he did go in to Normandy by intent, why? It seemed a very risky thing to do. He was one claimant to the English throne. William was another claimant to the English throne. Did it make sense for one claimant to put himself under the roof of, at the mercy of, the other claimant? Was it not simply asking, begging for trouble? We don't know. We know that Edward was childless. We know that the throne was going to be vacant. Everybody knew that the atmosphere was becoming more and more electric. Nothing was actually said, but everybody knew. So Harold spent the summer in Normandy as William's guest. Uh, he was in fact captured by some obscure Norman baron who thought Harold would make uh, very good material for ransom. But when everybody found out who Harold was, William travelled to meet this baron, tapped him on the shoulder and said, look, if you know what's good for you, you'll hand Harold over to me, which he duly did. So Harold was the guest of William for the whole of that summer, which of course raised the question, two questions. Once again, what on earth was Harold up to? And secondly, what on earth do we do with him? Uh, do we just entertain him and, and give him board and lodging for as, as long as necessary? How long is necessary? One obvious thing, of course, is to cut his throat, uh, which would simplify the arithmetic considerably. But William, knowing what he was about to embark upon, has to make sure that he's in the right. Damn it, he's going to steal somebody else's territory. He's got to be in the right. And if, he's, if it's proved that he has committed a crime like murdering a guest, it won't do his public reputation any good. So we can't kill him. He doesn't want to send him back without getting some kind of profit. He's had Harold dropped in his lap. If he lets him go back with nothing done, it seems that he's missed a wonderful opportunity. What do we do? Well, in the summer, it was quite common for feudal lords, barons, counts, dukes, whatever, kings, they went campaigning. There was always a campaign to fight somewhere. There was always somebody on the borders of your land causing trouble, and you sent off a punitive expedition to wrap him over the knuckles and tell him to behave himself. Or you went and did some raiding yourself. It worked both ways. And at that particular time, um, the Duke of Brittany, next door to Normandy, was causing trouble. Conan, his name was. Um, William embarked on a campaign and took Harold with him. It seemed to make sense. It was something to do. It kept, uh, he could keep his eye on Harold. It was a way of testing Harold. It was a way for William to find out how Harold behaved. What sort of a man have we got here? And Harold, by the same token, say to himself, right, I'll watch William on campaign. See what a sort of commander he is. What's he like? What's he made of? So off they went to Brittany to besiege Count Conan and his castles. And it was very successful. And in the course of it, they had to cross a river which was noted for its marshes and quicksands. And two Norman soldiers got into trouble. And guess who fished them out but Harold, Earl of Wessex. And the picture is in the tapestry. There is Harold. You can tell it's Harold because he has a moustache. All the, all the Englishmen are depicted with moustaches. The Normans are always shown as clean shaven. So you know who's on which side. And there is Harold dragging these two Norman soldiers out of the River Quenon. Well, William decides to make something out of this. So he has to thank Harold for what he's done. And he decides to thank him publicly. So he gives him um, a sort of Duke's honour. He makes him a knight. 
as the Queen did in her recent birthday honours. But you see, in the 11th century, knighthood meant a bit more than a gong. Knighthood in the 11th century, if you became a knight created by somebody, you became that somebody's vassal. You became their inferior. You became their servant. You were committed to service to them. So what William had done was to set up a ceremony in which everybody could see that he was the overlord, Harold was the vassal. Wonderful for public relations. That was not the whole of it either. Uh, the next set of panels we see is this famous oath in which Harold lays his hands on two altars and swears that when King William died, God forbid, he, Earl Harold, would help him, Duke William, to become the King of England. While at the time it seemed just an ordinary routine day-to-day -day oath. But when the oath was over, the story goes that Bishop Odo, once again up to no good, Bishop Odo had the covers taken off the altars. And there, underneath the covers, in the altars, were the relics of saints. Now, as you well know, the medieval world set great store by the relics of saints. They were magical. They could produce miracles. They were very, very significant indeed. So everybody utters gasps. Oh, my God. Harold has sworn the most holy of oaths that he will help England, uh, William become king of England. Um, well, of course, we all know, and any lawyer will tell you, that any oath sworn under duress doesn't count. But it didn't half count in 1066. William trumpeted this, as you can imagine, all over Europe. Harold didn't give a damn as long as he got him out of England and got him home. It achieved the object of the exercise. But that's what happened. This was the famous oath at Bayeux. Um, it made sense for William, certainly, because it was a wonderful coup for public relations. Now we've got to go on to another general idea for a moment. Let's say we'll, we'll entertain you to a little bit of background once again. In the Middle Ages, one of the great problems for rulers was public relations. How on earth do they transmit what they want to the people? How do they transmit laws? How do they transmit orders? How do they make their will known to the people? Well, most people, as you know, couldn't read and write. There was no printing press. There was no television. There was no radio. There were no newspapers. How on earth do they do it? Well, all sorts of ways they grab any possible technique they can lay their hands on. They paint pictures. They draw pictures. They, they embroider pictures like the bio tapestry. Uh, they, they build statues. Uh, they mint coins. It's no coincidence that the king's head appears on the coins. They put up great big buildings to make everybody suitably impressed with the enormity of the king's rule. Look at the size of the Egyptian public buildings. Uh, they travel themselves. One of the great tricks of kingship is to be seen. They know who you are, and they've seen you, and they know where you are, and they know you turn up regularly. Um, travel, travel, travel. Quite a lot of medieval kings, they say, practically rode themselves to death, going all around the country, being seen. And it was during these travels that they had to provide justice, that they had to show everybody that everything was secure, that everything was all right. The king went on these great big progresses, and it continued into the modern period. The Tudors were great travellers and progressors. Think of how many uh, manor houses where they tell you that Queen Elizabeth slept here, or where Henry VIII slept here, whatever. They loved progressing all over the place. Elizabeth was a vain woman. She adored doing this, making a great fuss and waving her hands, people cheering, and good Queen Bess and all the rest of it. So, it, but it, it, there was a reason behind it. <clears throat> and so you have these, you, you could call them comic strips, I suppose. Um, but they did have a reason and they did have a message. And that bit about uh, giving Harold knighthood and the swearing of the oath was absolutely invaluable because it could be seen. This was why so many ceremonies took place in public. It was no good 
a few barons meeting in a hall somewhere and signing a document, assuming they could write, um, nobody knew. But if it was done out in the open or in a great big hall or on a field with hundreds and thousands of people there actually witnessing it for themselves, there was no argument about that. They had seen it with their own eyes. And that was proof. And it was not new. The bio tapestry was nothing like the first comic strip. As I said, go back to ancient Egypt. Look at all those pictures on the walls of pyramids. So we're talking about something three and four thousand years old. It's as old as the hills. The Babylonians did it. Look at what the Greeks did on the, on the frieze of the Parthenon in Athens. The Emperor Trajan built this enormous column in Rome on which were engraved, carved the record of all his victories, Trajan's Column. <laughs> Think of Trafalgar Square. Is it any basically different? Um, so there's a lot in the bio tapestry. Don't be put off by... Uh, if you look at the picture of, of William giving arms, giving uh, knighthood to Harold, it's very easy to snigger at the fact that well, he doesn't look very much like a human being, does he? Uh, yes, you can poke fun at some of the, not all the draftsmanship, but you can poke fun at some of the draftsmanship. But that's not the point, because there are times when the draftsmanship is quite remarkable. You visit Bayer itself, go to the tapestry, and stand in front of the tapestry, that part of the tapestry, where the Norman cavalry are getting ready to advance. The drama is quite palpable. You can almost hear the beating of the hoofs on the ground. It, it, it is quite remarkable the effect that these, these, these um, embroideries have. Uh, not done by military artists. These are done by ladies in Canterbury. Well, as far as we know, they're done by English women, not Norman women. And they're done by seamstresses in Canterbury. How did they know all about this? Uh, it's also worth noting, too, that the draftsmanship is remarkable for its Sheer scale. There are something like 600 people embroidered on that tapestry. 600. There are something like 200 horses. I don't know if you've ever tried to draw a horse, but it is extremely difficult. And there's one scene in that where there's a normal cavalry charge. And uh, many horses obviously fall. And it is, it is so modern. You can feel the impact of those falling horses. To this day, it, it is quite astounding that these women were able to do it. So don't be superior about the bio tapestry. I said, look at it from the point of view of the 11th century. Judge it from the standards of the time. Secondly, don't be afraid of the bio tapestry. You say, well, what's, what, what am I going to get out of it? Because all the inscriptions are in Latin. Yes, it's true. But Latin is the ancestor of English. And there are lots of Latin words which you can recognise in English today. You can make good guesses. For example, if you see Edwardus, you don't have to have an awful lot of grey cells to work out that Edwardus means Edward, or Wilhelmus means William, or Haroldus means Harold. Bully for you. Go to the top of the class. Uh, you can deduce things. Uh, you see a picture of a ship, and underneath it says Navigawit. You think, what the hell does navigarbit mean? But think of our English word navigator. And you've got a picture of a ship. So it seems a reasonable guess that navigarbit means sailing. And you'd be dead right. So you can do a lot of Sherlock Holmes stuff as well. We have foreign words ourselves now. We, 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 you shouldn't shy away from a word just because it's foreign. We have cafe, we have buffet, we have blitz, we have spaghetti, plaza, vendetta... All these foreign words strewn across English, and we're used to them. And sheer gumption. Take the word sacramentum. Have you ever heard it? I don't suppose you have. But there is Harold sitting on the throne with an orb in one hand and a scepter in the other, and it says sacramentum. Isn't it reasonable to assume that this means a, an oath, a coronation? So there's a lot you can get out of the biotapestry. And don't expect to grab it all off the bat straight away. Uh, think about it, read it, go away, and pennies will drop when you're not looking at it. And you come back and think, oh, yes, yes, of course. Why didn't I work that out before? And there aren't all that many drawings, and uh, there aren't all that many words. There are far more pictures than there are words. So you can get a lot out 
of the Mayo Tapestry. And don't just look at the, the action bit in the middle. They've got a frieze at the top and they've got a frieze at the bottom. And all sorts of things are going on in those friezes. Right, legendary animals and trees and people and all the rest of it. Um, but they use the frieze. Uh, it's as if there was some kind of um, roving reporter going over the battlefield, pointing his camera at evocative scenes. So you get pictures of dead men, obviously. You get pictures of the survivors pulling the chainmail tunics off the head of dead men. You see disembodied arms. You see one head up in the air. An axe has gone through that man's male collar, right through the chainmail collar one side, outside, out the other side, and taken his head off with it. It's an astounding picture. So it's all there. It's stark, and it's rude, and it's realistic. And it's done by all these genteel ladies in Canterbury. How did they find out about it? Uh, and then one or two rude bits as well. A gentleman with no clothes on, who, and the, clearly their mind is not on the Battle of Hastings. And these ladies carefully, carefully stitched it all. So something as dramatic uh, and as clever and unique and old. It's 950 years old. It deserves a good look. There is a chance that the French government will lend it to us later on in the year. And if they do, I strongly suggest that you, that you go and have a look. You might be very pleasantly surprised. So, the bio tapestry. Do we swallow it? Well, of course, parts of it, yes. Other parts, clearly not. Um, it was, we remember all the time what the intention was behind it, to prove that William was right and that Harold was wrong. We also know from our other studies of history that the actual conquest of England uh, <clears throat> took a good deal longer than a few, few hours slogging it out on a hillside in Sussex. Now consider the question of the result of all this. Assuming that the biotapestry has done its job, Hastings is over, the English have run away. William has been crowned king. Incidentally, they don't show you the coronation of William in the bio tapestry. I suppose it's possible that it would have been the very final panel in the bio tapestry, but we know that the last bit of it has been destroyed. Did that last bit contain the coronation of William, which would have been the perfect dramatic finale to the whole thing? Harold commits a crime. He is a perjurer. He loses, he is punished, he is killed, and William, as God's representative, is crowned as king, and everybody lives happily ever after. Well, we've lost it, so we don't know. But did the English accept Hastings? Did they say, in effect, well, OK, William, uh, the best side won, and um, let's try and make the best of it from now on, shall we? Common sense will tell you that that didn't happen. Therefore, did it mean that England, for the rest of William's reign, all 21 years of it, was in a state of permanent revolt? Common sense tells you that that's unlikely as well. You very rarely find blacks and whites in history. It's all a series of greys. A bit of this and a bit of that. What we do know for sure is that William was now the master of an entire country. And he, he, he physically owned it. He, he was the owner. He was the physical owner, the legal owner, the actual owner, the, the, the church-recognised owner. Every way you care to look at it, William owned. Uh, like you own your house or you own your bicycle, William owned England, and he could do with it as he liked, and he proceeded to do so. Uh, of course, he now had to run it. He couldn't run it himself, and he had to have his Norman Baron. The ones who had been brave enough, or rash enough, to risk all to follow him, now could enjoy the rich pickings in England, uh, as William shared them out. Now, the Norman, the, the Saxon nobility, had very obligingly killed a lot of themselves off at the Battle of Stamford Bridge and the Battle of Hastings. So William, uh, to a certain extent, had a fairly clear run when it came to allocating land. Of course, these Saxons left uh, young boys as their heir, and sadly, many of them got pushed on one side 
as the Norman barons took over uh, the Saxons' land. Um, it turned out to be the biggest shift of land ownership pretty well in English history up to that time. The, the only comparable shift in land ownership came four or five hundred years later with the dissolution of the monasteries, which is quite an epic in itself. What did ordinary people think about the Norman Conquest? Well, poor souls, it didn't really matter what they thought about it. There was certainly nothing they could do about it. But whether they could or not, we don't really know because they couldn't read and they couldn't write and they didn't write anything down, so we don't know. We can just make an intelligent guess. Life was hard. It had always been hard. It was going to carry on being hard. Uh, you would still have to pay taxes. A landlord was a landlord. The English weather didn't change. So in many, many ways, life hadn't changed all that much for the English, except that their landlord now spoke a different language and possibly couldn't understand theirs. What about the winners? What happened to them? You ask yourself for a minute, it's wonderful to have had the adventure, to have risked all, to have won the battle, to be given countless estates. I mean, some of the estates uh, Norman barons uh, came into possession, ran into the hundreds all over the place. Um, what did they know about these new lands? Did they even know where they were? How many of them had visited England before? How many of them knew anything about English? How many of them spoke English? How many of them knew anything about English law, English customs, English anything? What, about they, what did they know about the English church? What did they know about communications in England? And all this, remember, has to be seen to, and they've still got their estates in Normandy. They can't leave them alone for long. They can't neglect them, because if they do, there are going to be some naughty neighbours sooner or later who are going to take advantage of their absence. So these Norman barons have to commute regularly. William commuted regularly between England and Normandy. <coughs> so the Norman barons had an awful lot to learn. And that wasn't the end of it either, because England, remember, had neighbours. Was, was the Kingdom of Norway going to accept the defeat at Stamford Bridge? Would they not come back for a revenge expedition? <coughs> Would Denmark have another crack at putting a Danish king on the English throne? Would Scotland start their antics again? After all, England had a broken government, it had a decimated nobility. It had a whole year of war, it had two invasions. If ever there was a chance for the King of Scotland to cause trouble, uh, this was it. So you think of all those problems that existed and all the disadvantages that the Norman barons would have to deal with. It sometimes makes you wonder why, why the Normans thought it was worth all the trouble in the first place. <laughs>